Saddleback, hello. And hey, if you're joining us online or watching from all of our other campuses, we just wanted to say, hey, welcome. Even if you're one of our extensions, I just want to say we're one family in many locations, and uh, I'm expecting the Lord to do something incredible in your life. Now, my name is Reward Sabanda. Everybody say Sabanda. So you got to, yeah, exactly. You got to say it with that gravitas, you know what I'm saying? That, that Africanism. And that's because uh, even though uh, your boy is based in Dallas, Texas, but I'm originally from Bulawayo in Zimbabwe, right? And so, uh, and in that conversation, I am what you call, well, thank you, thank you. But uh, <laughs> I am what you call a hollaback preacher. I'm a hollaback communicator. You know what I'm talking about? And, and what that means is if I say something and you think it's good, you don't have to be quiet. You know what I'm saying? You can talk back to your boy. It is not rude in this context. So if you've ever had a black church fantasy where you want to talk when they're talking, I got you. But hey, my wife is here. Hey, Pam, wave to God's people. That is my wife, Pam, right there. Y'all, listen, she's what you call an Enneagram 7. You know, that's uh, another word for people that, that do whatever they want, and uh, people love them for it. And 99% of the time, she's laughing, and 99.9% .9 of the time, she's laughing at her own jokes. So... She truly is the, 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 the best part of me. She's also from Zimbabwe. Now, um, we're in arranged marriage, right? Now, now, I'm not talking about the African thing you might think of. I'm talking about the fact that she arranges everything in our marriage. And I show up, I do exactly as I'm told, and it's been an easy marriage, y'all. So if you're in an arranged marriage, you know what I'm talking about. But the rest of y'all take some notes. But listen, it is uh, such an honor for me to be here today. It's such a humbling honor uh, because Pastor Rick is just an incredible, incredible. It's, it's amazing to see what God has done through his obedience and the legacy that he has around the world. Like he was pastoring me when I was still a, con a, a continent away. And so I just want to thank him for his obedience and his gift. I mean, Saddleback, y'all are spoiled for incredible leadership over here. You have phenomenal campus pastors, phenomenal leaders, phenomenal staff that contribute to this ethos and the excellence that you see around y'all. So let me say this, and um, I am not lying. You guys have the absolute best church leadership within a five-mile radius of wherever you are. <laughs> Beyond that, I don't want to be a liar, you know what I'm saying? But within five miles, you guys are killing it. But no, in all honesty, um, you have an incredible leadership, and I am so honored to be and among that is Andy and Stacy, man. Uh, incredible people, love God, are faithful to the call, and truly, truly a gift to this generation. And they are your pastors. So, man, wherever you are, Andy and Stacy, honor you guys. You are good people. I mean, down to earth. I'm talking good, sweet potato pie. Well, if I was in Texas, I'm over here. So, a crouton salad with kale, vegan, whatever you guys do in, uh, in California. That's how down to earth they are. But yeah, it's such an honor for me to be here uh, to close out the Transferring Trust series. I feel like Andy has done such an incredibly masterful job in communi communicating a very complex topic such as money, right? Money always makes us nervous um, in any context, whether in the world, whatever, as humanity and I truly think it's because money is uh, the value system. I think money is the, med the medium of exchange, but it's also how uh, we, we, we speak value, how we gauge value generationally. And so it's very easy for us to get twisted and caught up. And for someone to teach as masterfully as Pastor Andy has, there's got to be a level of faithfulness that they have essentially shown to be able to do that. So I've truly, truly enjoyed the, the series and if I were to distill the series, the essence of everything that he has said across these three weeks, which if you haven't, by the way, you should go back and look at those. But if I was to distill the essence of it, it would come down to the simple thought. And the thought is the simple thing that we are stewards. That nothing that we have is ours at all. God has called us to be stewards of the things that he has entrusted us with. And I understand this because I grew up in a home that valued a lot of, of stewardship. I, I, I grew up in that. And we were taught to take care of things. Well, first of all, because we really didn't have that many things. But if I were to distill it, it would come back to this statement right here. 
And here's one statement. It is, it's not ours. I want you to say, it's not ours. It might be in your hand. You might be paying the mortgage, right? You may be the one that has the keys to it, but in reality, it is not ours. Now, that's a, maybe an uplifting statement, but for me, there's a little bit of traumatic triggering in that. And in order for you guys to understand, I got to tell y'all the story of the radio. Okay, let me try that again, all right? Gen Z and um, Alpha Generation, this is a radio. <laughs> okay, crickets. Let me try it one more time. This is what Apple Music and Spotify look like without makeup. <laughs> it's called a radio. And uh, believe it or not, way back in the day, songs used to come out of here and music. And it was funny because the very earliest aspects of it was what you call a dynamo radio. So you would crank this thing and music would come out of it. That's why music was so much better back then. Like, I'm not cranking over here if your music sucks. You know what I'm talking about? But... I'm going to get to the story of the radio, but in order for you to truly understand the, the trauma that I'm talking about, I got to take you guys, give you guys some perspective on my family. Same mom, same dad. Let me ask you guys this. How many of you guys have siblings? I am so sorry for you. No, I'm kidding, right? How many of you guys have over six siblings? All right, we're going for gold. How many of y'all have over 10 siblings? Listen, your boy has 12 siblings, y'all. Same mom, same dad. I'm, I'm talking about, and, 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 and here's the thing. I mean, we have one, and we're like tearing our hair out. We're like, man, I wonder what sleep looks like. But here's the thing. In the Debelo, the Zulu context, where I came up, there's a system. Oh, yeah, my dad had a system, and this is how you raise it. So your parents pour everything that they have into ch raising child number one and child number two, and then before God and men, they're done. You know, they can retire. They're like, yes. And then child number one raises child number three. And then child number two raises child number four. And the cycle keeps going on and on. Your boy is number 11, y'all. Can you imagine how many siblings have raised me? I mean, think about it this way, right? Right now, you go on social media. If people get kids, we're that way. Pam and I are. Child number one, everything is a Kodak moment, right? And child number six around there, it's only the special things, the highlights. When you get to child number 11, you're the one taking the family pictures. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, uh, that's literally what they call me, number 11. You know, like uh, some soccer team or, or, or something. Or football, if you're kind of watching from all over the world. And you can kind of even tell in the way that I was named. My name is Reward. Do you know what our firstborn is? Owen. You see, there was intentionality around that. It's a normal name. You get to number 11, it's like Reward. I, I always picture my dad was out there watching Discovery Channel. That means you was looking out the window because we're in Africa. But, <laughs> but I always picture him, right? My mom comes in like, what do you want to name him? Like, eh, he mumbles something. Like, do you say Raymond or Reward? He's like, whatever. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, that's how I got the name Reward. No, true story. My, the brother, my brother, the one who comes after me, you know what his name is? Message. That's his name. I remember in school they used to call him SMS. But that's how you know. <laughs> Man, those kids were brutal. But that's how you know that all the creativity is gone. I mean, your parents are just like, you guys raise each other. You'll be, you'll be fine. It's also another reason that my, the firstborn was a meteorologist, and uh, there's doctors in the family, and then the third is an accountant and everything. You know what I do for a living? I stand behind a mic and I sweat. You know what I mean? That's what I do. I'm kidding. I preach the gospel, and I love it. Take that, Mom. But it's, <laughs> it's one of those things, though. It's like you can always kind of tell when you go there. So it was one of those to where there were systems that raised me, but there were values that my dad would literally uh, instill in us. And one of those values was stewardship. That because you had to share things and there were hand-me-downs and everything, nothing that you really owned was yours. You were just a steward of that thing moving forward. And so uh, one day, my dad, he used to work for this organization called Dunlop, and towards the end of his, um, um, his tenure and towards his retirement, they gave him a radio, and they were like, hey, here you go. So I still remember my dad brought it back, right? And my dad had a flair for the dramatic. I mean, if you have 13 kids, you got to entertain them somewhere, right? Some way. And so I still remember he brought this, and he was like, he gathers around. He's like, listen, listen, I'm about to show you guys something. And then he starts cranking the radio, right? He cranks the radio. And then, what sorcery is this? 
music start coming out of this box and, and songs start coming out of this box and laughter. And it blows my little nine-year-old mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is happening, right? And I'm completely blown away by this. And so I was standing next to two siblings. Now, how many of you guys know there's always a good sibling, right? But then there's always the evil sibling. You know what I'm talking about? The one who always chooses chaos every time, like cats. You know what I'm saying? They have that in common. It's like, we choose chaos. So I turn, unfortunately, to him, and I'm like, what's going on? What is, what is this magic box? I was like, oh, it's very simple. So what it is is there's a lot of little villagers. There's a village inside this box. And so what happens is when you turn the handle, the crank, it releases food and then the villagers eat, and they get happy. Then they start singing and dancing, and that's the sound that comes out of this. I'm like, ingenious, right? My nine-year-old mind is like, ingenious. I'm blown away by this. And towards the end of the evening, I go to sleep, but my mind won't stop. And I'm going, you know what? I have an idea. Instead of just this one collective radio, what if I open the radio, emancipate all these little people, right? and put all of them in separate boxes and then take those boxes to school, then I can give it to all of my classmates and they can like me, right? Because I come to think of it, I didn't even think about that. That's called trafficking nowadays. Sorry, forget that. Back then I didn't think about it. But I'm thinking about this. I'm like, I'm going to take this to school. And y'all, I was about to be the African Oprah. You know what I'm saying? You get a radio. You get a radio. You get a radio. Everybody gets a radio, right? It's a brilliant idea. What could go wrong? And so... My parents uh, leave to go to work. I play hooky. I come back. I grab a screwdriver and I open it. And I'm like, huh, sneaky little people. They're hiding. So I keep unscrewing this thing and I'm going over here and everything. And after a while, it's like I get to like literally there's components everywhere. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. There are no happy, emancipated little people. There's no village. There's no radio. There's just the wrath of my father that I know is coming. As surely as a Texas sunrise, it is coming. And that's exactly what happened when my dad walks in through the door. All around there's components and everything. Now, I can't talk about what happened because we're in church and we don't, don't condone violence. But all I can tell you is it happened to me to the cadence of it's not yours. It's not yours. It's not yours. And since then, I developed a healthy side effect of um, respect for other people's property. But here's what I learned from there. And if I were to distill the whole essence of uh, our Transferring Trust series that we've been talking about, it's the simple fact that just the fact that it is yours does not mean it is yours. Everything about collective human experience is the simple fact that God has entrusted us with specific things and that when we're good stewards of those things, then he entrusts us with more, what the world calls wealth. We call true wealth because then those things flow through us and become a blessing to everybody else. And when we understand that that is the core essence of why we have blessings and why some people have more things than the others, then that in itself is a message that is preached. So my conversation today is I want to talk about uh, fruitfulness and faithfulness. If we truly want to understand, someone said this and I thought it was pretty deep. They said where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it with the best of intentions, right? It includes everything. If I don't know what this iPad is for and it just looks like a flat slab, I'm going to use it to, as a chopping board or something. It's just the way it is. And that includes relationships, by the way. If people don't know your purpose or why you exist, even if they link themselves with you under the umbrella of love, they'll abuse you because they don't truly understand why you exist. So in order for us to truly get the essence and get the gist of faithfulness, I want us to go back um, to the book of Genesis, right? What was in God's mind when he began, when he created humanity? And we all know the story. So he starts creating and um, he starts creating, crafting this beautiful world. And, uh, right, he starts going, oh, doing all of these things. He creates oceans and then he tells them to team with fish and then he calls it good and then he creates this and then he sees his imprint on that thing and then he calls it good and then he creates and so he's constantly going and he's creating this beautiful world with perfect smells and perfect sounds and and all of these things and it's almost like he does what my wife does when she's cooking right my wife always do, does this she's amazing she throws down in the kitchen so she will call me before the food is ready and when I show up and I'm like okay I'm ready to taste it she'll be like hold on 
And then she'll take something and sprinkle it with a little flair. And she'll be like, now try that. And so I feel like that's what God did, right? And so he waited for his crowning achievement. And then the council of the Godhead collectively comes up with the grandest idea that the Godhead has ever come up with. And I know sometimes uh, when you look at the people around you, maybe you think of the people um, in your life or your ex or whatever, you, you don't think this was it. But he goes, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. This is in Genesis 1, 26. And then he goes on to tell the purpose of what it looks like. So what is the purpose of why we exist, right? If we go into this, this is what it says in verse tw uh, 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over every creeping thing. And then afterwards it goes, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Let's look at it again. It says, God says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. When we look at it in English, it seems like it's redundancy. But when we go back into the original languages, the etymology, the word um, image right there is the word telem. And a direct translation into American would be form. And the word uh, likeness is the word damuth, and it literally means a function, right, when you translate it into contemporary English. So basically, the brilliant idea of the Godhead was, let us make man in our form to execute our function. That means every single person here was made in the form of God as a communal being that loves community and craves community to then step out there and execute the function of God. What is the function of God? It was to have dominion in whatever area he has placed you in. And whenever you step into the area that God has placed you in and you have dominion and you exercise dominion in that place, then the blessing of God is upon you because the mandate is that you go into a specific context and become fruitful and multiply. And the beautiful thing about that is uh, it's not one of those to where it's like, it's not utilitarian in its nature. It's not one of those to where when you go there and you become fruitful in that space, then God will bless you. No, but before they even stepped into that, it says, God, listen to this. It says, say, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea. And he says all of this. And then God said, listen to this, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields to you, they shall be for food. So the final thing that God gives us is provision. So he gives us a purpose, which is to be fruitful. And then he gives us a position in that place or a space to be fruitful in. And in that space, he gives us provision. We see a picture of this in the garden, right? As long as Adam stayed within the parameters of the garden, it says he didn't really have to labor. He just had to tend to the garden. But the garden was watered from within. And so that means there is a grace that is applicable to you as long as you're exactly where God wants you to be. So you are a divine construct and you have a distinct context. And your purpose is fruitfulness. Purpose, position, provision. Let's start with purpose. What is your purpose? It's right there. It's fruitfulness. We saw it in Genesis 1.26. It says God saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Be fruitful. See, I understand this because I am a farmer and I'm the son of a farmer. The reason my dad had, uh, because we're subsistence farmers, we lived off of the land. So the reason he had 13 kids, we were his workforce. He literally grew his own stash, right? But he taught me farming. And when I saw the value of farming, I was like, I'm going to teach my son pseudo farming. Because here's the thing. When you understand farming, you'll understand ministry. When you understand farming, you'll understand business. When you understand farming, you'll understand relationships because the underlying, the underpinning value that runs a parallel across everything is the power of process. When you understand the relational, the core relation between putting work in, waiting for that thing to come to fruition, and then enjoying the fruit. But unfortunately, we now exist in a generation where the indictment on this generation is the simple fact that we confuse fruit with fruitfulness. We have developed things that shorten the gestation period of anything that we are being fruitful or farming in. And because of that, we're the type of people to where I can do something stupid and then I can literally get views and followers and gain influence from that thing. And in most cases, the, the more stupid it is, the more viral 
it becomes. And what it's done is it's desensitized an entire generation to the value of process. And so we have, been, we have become people that look at fruit and equate that directly with fruitfulness. But that's not the process. And I feel like the reason that uh, the, the, the Adam's origins context was a farming or was agricultural and that a lot of God's uh, uh, examples that we find in the Bible are agrarian is number one, it transcends color, culture, and context. There is always going to be farmers and fields. But the second thing is because I believe it is one of those things that we have to understand. So, for example, as a farmer and with the, with the perspective tweaking and shifting your perspective a bit. A farmer understands that fruitfulness isn't when I eat or I see the fruit in harvest. No, a farmer will rise up in the morning and go to work and dig up hard ground and plant seed. And they will go to, the, to their home rejoicing and saying, I had a fruitful day. We can look at them culture and be like, what, what are you talking about, like fruitful day? Like, I don't see any fruit. I don't see any... But it's like, no, you understand that if God has called you to fruitfulness, then that in itself, you were fruitful in that day and you were faithful to your command and God is delighted in that. Because the fruit at the end of it, what people see, the platforms and, uh, and, 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 and the virality and all of that is just a quarter of the entire process. So the next season of it, a farmer will go out into the field and they'll see like, oh, it's beginning to bud and they will rejoice in that. Can they eat fruit out of it? No. But they know that it's a part of the process, so they rejoice in that, and they weed around it. And at the end of the day, they go back and they say, I am fruitful. And it's only a quarter at the end of it when you see fruit and you celebrate. But so many of us in this generation, we will look at people, right? Like Pastor Buddy and Pastor Tom and people who have been stewards of the truths of God and the grace of God and the pulpits of God. And, and they are able to teach on all of these things. And we'll look at them. And just because I got a few followers, I decide that I'm entitled to that. And that is one of the things that curtails fruitfulness more than anything. It's comparison. It's when we look at where someone else, we don't know what their field is or how long they've been in that field, but we see fruit in their field and we look at our season, which is season number one, and we're like, nothing's happening over here. This isn't working for me. Why don't I have the same fruit that they have? And we begin to have an attitude. But here, man, I was talking to Pastor David and he dropped this and he was like, man, it was an incredible scripture. And um, I... Um, I want to read it uh, to you guys. It says, Galatians 6, verse 4 to 5, Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we're responsible for our own conduct. You're responsible for the maturity of perspective to go, hey, they're in another field, farming another crop, in another season of their life, as long as I'm faithful to what God has called me to do, he rejoices in my fruitfulness, whether I see fruit or not. He does. And you know what the most beautiful thing about it is that um, the, our purpose is fruitfulness. But the, but the purpose of fruitfulness is that it brings God glory. John 15, verse 5 to 8, another agrarian uh, reference. It says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. It's about abiding. It's not about striving, right? For without me, you can do nothing. In the exact same way, that fruit is just attached to the mother tree and it bears fruit. It says, but if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in me, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. God is glorified when you bear much fruit. Here's a segue for, for this generation if you're kind of watching this. Another, 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 another thing that it says here is the simple fact that God is glorified when we bear fruit, regardless of whether people enjoy our fruit or not. Listen, there's a word to creators, right? Because so many times uh, we create because we, we, and then we take this good thing that God has given us and we gauge the value of our fruitfulness based on whether other people enjoy it or not. How many of you guys have ever seen an insecure tree? And it's like, I don't know if I should be into this mango thing. They never like my mangoes. They don't buy them. No, the, the tree finds the fullest expression of its purpose when it bears fruit. 
The farmer is glorified when that tree bears fruit. If people at the market buy or don't buy it, enjoy or don't enjoy the fruit, that is just an added value to it. And I feel like that's a word for someone right here to where maybe God has called you to do something and you're over here is like, will people like it? And you're compromising your artistic integrity and you're starting to mold it based on what you believe the algorithm wants and everything. And I just want to tell you the simple fact that your call is to be fruitful. And when you are fruitful in that place and you produce the fruit, God is glorified in your production of that fruit independent of whether people enjoy the fruit or not. God has called us to fruitfulness. And when we're fruitful, he blesses us with abundance. And then when we have that abundance, there is a call, which is what transferring trust is all about, for us to be faithful within that. So that, that is our purpose. The position is simple. God has placed each and every single one of us uniquely and divinely in whatever context it is. And we can't let the world define what context are value or are not. The reason I was so drawn and moved by this house at Saddleback is the simple fact that there were three greeters as I was walking with Pastor Jason who connected with me at such a deep level and they had such a contagious joy and they were talking about all the incredible things that God had done and how he's changed their lives in here. For some of us, our context is maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you're over there and you're being faithful in raising all these kids and it's not, believe me, there's nothing glamorous about toddlers at all. Don't let Instagram fool you. I mean, it is a throw up and, and the tantrums and all that. I mean, they're cute as all get out, believe me. But there's nothing glamorous around that. And so if God has called you and put you in that context to raise godly offspring, you might be in the daily grind of doing this and you feel like God doesn't see you and everything. Do you understand that by you being fruitful, God has been glorified in that? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells the story of a blue-collar worker called... Um, Cornelius, the guy who got to have, the, when, the, when the gospel was given to the Gentiles, the guy who was entrusted with the first in his household, the reason that we can enjoy pork chops and love Jesus was a guy called Cornelius. But Cornelius wasn't a priest or anything, no. He was just a blue-collar military worker. But when the word came to him, it says, hey, God has seen how you give to the poor, and God has seen all of your prayers, things done in secret. And because you've been fruitful, I can entrust you with something spiritual, the true riches, like uh, salvation to the Gentiles. It's the same thing with Anna in the Bible. She never did anything, but it says like she used to serve the God, God with prayers in the temple and everything. And she was one of the first people that got to see Jesus, the promise. Because listen to me, if you are positioned, God uniquely positioned you somewhere, and as long as you are faithful in that place of positioning, God is going to get glory out of you. He sees every time you iron. He sees you struggling in that business. He sees you working at that dead-end job. He sees you, whatever you do, he placed you in there because you are a light to everything that he has. And I want us to have this perspective that, hey, if you find yourself in something Hey, God has called me to this. I'm going to be faithful in this. And by being faithful, I'm going to be fruitful. And as I am fruitful, God is going to entrust me with true wealth. And as he entrusts me with true wealth, then I know exactly what I will do with it because I listened to the last three weeks of Pastor Andy's message on stewardship. Come on, somebody. And then the last thing I want to say is a provision on this particular thing. See, in Christ and in my assignment, I have all things we saw it in there. I like a second Peter verse one, two to four. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ for his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The abundance of heaven when you're in your place of positioning is yours. It's at your discretion. Are we seeing it? See, I like what it says. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ as his divine power has given us. The context of that, the spiritual context, I was talking about the physical context, but the spiritual context of that is we are in Christ. And in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen. Remember in the Old Testament, all the promises only came to you because you were, dis you were obedient. Blessings followed obedience. And what happens is Jesus comes and he hangs on the cross. And what he does is now, and as long as we're in union with Christ, then every promise and every blessing that follows obedience is ours as long as we're in union with Christ. It's got nothing to do with everything. It's got everything to do with believing who it is. So listen to me. So physically you may be positioned 
or planted. Let me put it that way. But spiritually and internally, you have to be rooted in Christ. See, a great example of this, uh, my wife is what you call a plant mom. Anytime she goes somewhere, she brings back a plant. It looks like uh, the continent of, 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 of Africa in our living room and everything. But, but, but here's what it is. She loves to move the plants around and put them in different places. And the reason she's able to do that is because the context doesn't matter as long as those plants have a root system. So as long as we are rooted in Christ, then God can move us from context to context based on our faithfulness in that place. Because when we're fruitful in one place, then he can take us and trust us with more and then move us to another place. And here's the beautiful thing out of all of this. If you don't get anything else, get this one thing right here. God gave us Jesus. I mean, we can talk about how, yeah, when is he going to give me the money or when is he going to give me the job and everything. The most valuable thing to ever exist in both created and uncreated worlds is Jesus. And the Bible in Romans 8 says, if he gave you Jesus, how much more will he not freely give you all these other things to enjoy? See, so use that as a defense against the next time the world says, you don't have this car, you don't have this, you're not valuable. And you're like, nah, baby, I have Jesus. If he entrusted you with Jesus, how much more? Because when you accept that and in Christ, you have all this provision and you have all these things flowing inside of you. So if you're saying this reward, then why don't I see it? That's a good question. And here's what I believe. I think our perspective has everything to do with it. Is my perspective a problem? What, what, what am I seeing, right? I love how Pastor Stacy, um, a couple of weeks back, gave us the mother of all illustrations. It was perfect. Where she had those two filters, and uh, she was talking about one of those filters is fear, and one of those filters is faith. And I was like, you know what? I will repurpose that because it is such a poignant uh, descriptor to this. And talk about it uh, to this generation, and talk about... Uh, filters or an Instagram generation, not air filters, but those type of filters, filters that filter our perspective. And I say there are two primary uh, lenses or two primary thick filters for our perspective. One is faith and one is fear, right? The concept is sound. We heard it and everything. And it's one of those things that whatever, whenever we look through the lens of fear, we see some things and miss some things. And whenever we look through the lens of faith, we see some things and, and we miss some things because both of them are storytellers and they're constantly projecting in our minds uh, different outcomes of the thing that you are in. One of those is the worst case scenario and the other based on God's faithfulness and his litany and track record of love and provision is one where you come out on top and, uh, and God has been with you and he comforts you even if it doesn't look the way it is. So is it possible that our perspective is what has uh, uh, taken us away from this? And I think one of the most uh, masterful examples of this is uh, Pastor Andy preached an incredible sermon on it. Uh, it is the parable of the talents. I still remember I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit on my stewardship that after I listened to it, I was like, let me go and do a deep dive on it because uh, I have uh, what you call an uh, ethnocentric bias. No, that's not really a, a disease or anything. They don't make a cream for that. But here's what an ethnocentric uh, bias is. Ethnocentrism is what you call the evaluation of other cultures according to preconceptions originating in the standards and customs of one's own culture. So, for example, um, some uh, biblical uh, sociologists uh, did this study on the story of the prodigal son. And if, you, if you've read it in the Bible, it's basically the son, he goes to his father and he asks for his inheritance. And then he takes that inheritance, goes to a faraway land and completely squanders that. And then he comes back and he says, uh, Dad, can I just be your servant? And he does this. And the father uh, wraps his arms around him and he completely forgives him and he reinstates him into a place of honor. It's a beautiful narrative and there's so many parallels about the grace and the beauty of God. But they took that narrative and they went around the world and they asked different people um, this one statement, why did the prodigal son fail? Right? And so they went to people in the Soviet context. And they say, why did he fail? And they said, oh, it's simple. He failed because there was a famine. Then they went to Latin America and neighbors, and they say, why did the prodigal son fail? And the people there said, oh, it's obvious. He was a foreigner, and no one helped him. They went uh, to the Asian context, and they asked, why did he fail? And he said, oh, he brought dishonor on his family. Right? 
And they went to the African context where I come from, where Ubuntu, the social philosophy, speaks uh, to togetherness and the value of family. They say, why did he fail? It's like, it's easy. He left his family and he went to another land. Then they came right here to the U.S. and say why he failed. They say it's easy. He made bad investment. He had bad money choices. He didn't have a money mentor. He had horrible discipline, and he didn't make the right investments. The same parable, right? Completely different value systems. So when I was reading the story of of, of the parable of the talents, I always assumed, because I was coming from a context of lack, I always assumed that it was just a little bit of coin. As a matter of fact, that's what we're taught in Sunday school. But then I started doing research after Pastor Andy's uh, uh, sermon, and I noticed that a talent was actually a measure. And a talent was equal to 6,000 denarii, which a denarii was a day's wage in biblical times. So it was equal to 6,000 denarii or 20 years of daily wages for a six-day work week. So this master didn't just give the servant uh, a coin Right? When I did some ghetto math uh, based on the blue collar like, uh, minimum wage, I found out that after calculations, he gave him in today's money $714,240 US. And when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's why the master was so ticked off. He didn't just bury a coin, he took an entire industry and he buried it. And my challenge to you is, What is our perspective, right, when it comes to the things that God has entrusted? Why do we not see his provision? Is it my perspective about me or is it about millions? There's a number that a a, a psychologist came up with called the Dunbar number. And basically it says the number of meaningful relationships we can have is 150 people. And so when I did my uh, ghetto math, I found out that if you take that and you percentage it against the 8 billion population of the world... Um, is the simple fact that it comes to 0.001875. Y'all, listen, fear is bad math. What am I talking about? You are letting the thing that God has placed inside you, whether it's a business or relationship, whatever, you are letting 0.001, whatever it is, you're letting that percentage keep 8 billion people from experiencing what God has for them. Is it any wonder that the indictment of that servant was that he was lazy and evil? Listen, God, what God has given you isn't about you. It's not about you. It's about the millions that will benefit with what that looks like through you. Pastor Rick's book, one simple book. I don't know if he was confident that he was going to do what he was supposed to do. But no, I believe that he was like, hey, let me just be faithful to what God is calling me to do. And he became fruitful in that. And years later, we're standing here based on the back of his fruitfulness. fruitfulness. Is my perspective about me or millions? The second one is my perspective about a mooch or a master. In America, a mooch is someone who lives off of Uh, the work of other people. And that's what this servant says right here. It's like, hey, I knew that you like to sow where you didn't reap, so I went and I hid it. What is our perspective of God? Is he someone who loves to bless us and bless people through us? Because listen, we don't give to the church. We give through the church. Generosity is a generational mandate, and God takes what we've entrusted with him with, and he blesses the generations around us. That's why we went through the 90-day the trust challenge here because we had to shift our perspective to looking as God as Lord and master of everything that he has blessed us with. And finally, is my perspective about poverty or is it about plenty? See, listen, nature has no reference point for poverty. Look at everything that God created. Everything. The leaves, you can't count them. Sands, you can't count them. Snowstorm, you can't count them. Nature doesn't hold on to things. When the season is over, the leaves drop because the next year there's going to be a replenishment. You cannot look at nature, which is a direct mirror of the nature of God, and see lack anywhere. You know why? Because poverty is a perspective. What do I mean? When Adam ate the fruit, which is what I tell my wife always happens when you force a man to eat vegetables. Everything goes sideways, right? But what happened? The moment he ate fruit, the abundance of God around him didn't disappear. But his perspective shifted, and for the first time, he shifted away from all the abundance that was around him and on the one thing that he lacked. Because poverty is a myopic perspective where you focus on that which you do not have and not on, the, on, the, on, on everything around you. 
Poverty is the first side effect of sin. And we all know this because you don't have to not have money to have poverty. Listen, I know all of you guys know people here who are so poor that all they have is money. You look at those people and their money has them so bound and they're so stingy and so scroogey and everything to where you're over here and they're like, I don't think you have money. I think money has you. But the beautiful thing about you yielding and seeing that I've been entrusted with this is because you can begin to release the blessings of God. And you can begin to bless local churches like Saddleback that do incredible life-changing work around the world. And for me, this perspective couldn't have been truer than um, what just happened recently where my wife was like, hey, um, I, I surprised my wife after um, our son, and I was like, hey, let's go to Fiji. I was cheap. I had the points for it. It was cheap. So I was like, hey, let me win husband of the year and uh, take you to Fiji. And so my wife's like, oh, great. You know what? If I take you to Fiji, then we can go skydiving. Sevens. I don't know how they came from here to there, but she was right there, and she was waiting for me. I was like, hey, this is what I say, y'all. I said, hey, if that's what you want to do, I didn't say we. I said if that's what you want to do. But that's not what my wife heard. Because when we got to Fiji, right, she wakes me up this morning with like giddy excitement. And she's like, guess what? I booked our skydiving. We're going skydiving today. I was like, oh my, oh my God. Did you? No. I don't want to skydiving. And she's like, oh, you don't want to go skydiving? Well, it's okay if you're scared. <laughs> Listen, reverse psychology works every time. And so I was like, I'm not scared and everything. I was scared. I was terrified. I was petrified. You know what I'm saying? You know why? Let me tell you why. In my defense, right, in the African context or in the Ndebele or the Zulu context, it doesn't just matter that you die. It matters how you die. So I wasn't going to be a cautionary tale around African fires for eternity where people talk about, hey, that guy, he fell out of a plane. I was like, how? You know what I'm saying? So I was like, I don't want to do it. But she was like, no. And I knew she was going to punk me. So I was like, you know what? Fine. I'm going to do it. So we show up to this thing and they pair us up. And she's paired off with this guy. He's like, hey, you're going to be fine. I've done this millions of times. I was a South African Special Forces. We're going to be good. Let me check your things and everything. And then my guy shows up. He's like, hey, that's your guy. He's like, his name is Jean-Luc, but he doesn't barely speak any English. I'm like, great. And then so he points to me. He's like, hey, hey, Texas. And the guy goes, ooh, Texas. Big hats, pew, pew, pew. I'm like, wait, 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 what does that mean? Let's, let's solve this on the ground. I don't want to go up there with you. Do you hate Texas? Are you from Oklahoma? Like, what, what's going on over here, right? But anyways, uh, I get up on there. Long story short, we go up and higher and higher, 15,000 feet. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be crazy. And he can tell I'm freaking out, so he decides to give me two pep talks. And the first pep talk is this. He's like, hey, he tried to do comedy. With his limited lexicon, as a side gig, he chose comedy. He points to his, um, to his GoPro. He's like, hey, here's the deal, okay? You smile, I pull. You don't smile, I don't pull. I was like, that's not funny. That's not funny at all. And he, he can tell that I'm like, hey, whatever. So he decides to give me um, another. He was like, okay, okay, listen. It's easy, easy. Okay, you're supposed to be like this, like happy banana. Not straight, like pancake. I'm like, dude, you, all your food analogies are wrong right now. You don't mention pancakes when someone's about to jump from a plane, right? And so this guy's like, whatever. And then he can tell I'm, ag I'm getting like visibly agitated. And so the last thing he says, okay, listen, I'm good. 500 jumps, I'm good. Parachute, good. Fly. I'm like, man, that is the worst pep talk in the history of bad pep talks ever. But anyway, so the plane gets there, and they're like, okay, it's time to jump. And so they open, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the first time I've been in a plane with the door open. I'm like, this is crazy. So he says, okay, one, two, three. There's no backing out of it. And so I lean over, and I'm like, Shh. Now, I'd love to tell you that it was beautiful, and uh, I saw it, and I'm like, no. But this picture right here is worth, worth a thousand words, because that is what your boy was thinking right there. And then this picture right there, I still remember what I was thinking. All of a sudden, I'm like, no, I'm not flying and everything. I'm like, African, you are falling. That's what's happening right now. And then I get this revelation. I'm like, wait a second. There's nothing black up here at all. There's no black hawks. I mean, there's no ravens. There's no crows. Like, I am probably this, and I am freaking out. And I start freaking out. And he can tell I'm freaking out because I'm like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. And then he taps me. He's like, hey, 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 I'm good. The parachute is good. 
Now fly. And the moment he says that, and by the way, this is Pam's picture right here the whole time. <laughs> I know, right? And I'm like, you did this. And she's over here. She's having the time of her life. And I'm, I'm hating her with everything I have. But listen, though. The moment he says that, the moment he says that, I'm like, wait, he's right. It's not how hard I'm holding on to this thing. It's his experience and the parachute. And I truly can. And the moment that that happens, I open my eyes and my eyes are open to all of the abundance of God. The most beautiful scenery over Fiji. And for the first time, I'm like what Dr. Sue says, it's open as air in the wide open air. And it was the most exhilarating views that I'd ever seen. And I had missed all of it because my perspective was on my fear. And so here's my challenge to y'all as I bring this to a close. When I was talking to, um, to Pastor Andy, this is what he told me. Pastor Andy was like, I was like, hey, after all the teaching that you've done, where would you land, where would you like me to land this? What is the one thought you want God's people to take away from this? And he said, oh man, it's got to be where it started. The goodness of God. See, in the book of Genesis, God creates everything and he says it's good. And he says, hey, if people can learn to anchor their finances, their trust, their giftings, and their callings on God's goodness, then stewardship will just be a side effect of what happens. And so my challenge to everyone in this room, if you guys don't mind just standing up right here, in prayer and preparation, I just felt like God was calling some people to just entrust him and to anchor two things on his goodness. Number one, your area of fruitfulness, the place that he's called you to, the space that he's called you to. And the second thing is the fear that is stopping you from seeing his abundance and his provision in that place and in that space. And if that's you, wherever you are, whether you're watching online or in this room, I just want you to take 30 seconds to just commune with your father. To just say, Father, I've, I've, I've let my perspective shift and uh, I've started to look at this blessing and this context and this place of fruitfulness as a burden or as a chore or as purgatory or whatever that looks like. And I just want you to realign your perspective and say, you've placed me here and when I'm fruitful in this place, you get the glory. And the second are things that God has placed things on the inside of you and called you to certain things. And in that place and in that space, Fear rises up because fear is the natural response to when God calls us to do things which are above ourselves. And I just feel like the Lord is wanting you to entrust him with your fruitfulness and with your fear. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want us to take 30 seconds and just say, God, you can have it all. You entrusted me with your trust. Now I entrust you with everything back. Just speak to your father right now. Just give him that family, give him that business, give him the things that are stealing your sleep. Just hand it back to him and accept the responsibility that God has placed on the inside of you. A fruitfulness that can change an entire generation. So Father, I just come before you, Lord, and I just thank you for this word that you have blessed me with. And I pray that it has been a blessing to your people in person and online across our campuses. I just pray that the ethos and the culture of Saddleback would be one of profound stewardship, of trust in that which you have entrusted them with. That at the end of it, money would not be our master, but we would know that we're stewards of everything that you've given unto us. So we once again lay it at your feet and you ent we entrust you with everything. Our fear our faithfulness, and our fruitfulness, knowing that anchored on the goodness of God, you'll use our lives to bless lives across the world. We ask, we thank you, and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you all.